Well, we'll start off. Uh, I just want to talk about index, uh, just because it's a general introduction. I imagine a lot of people here under uh, deal with this concept all the time. But uh, one of the reasons I was interested in AP Monitor was the higher index systems I was dealing with. And when I talk about index, uh, I'll be using the simple definition of differentiation index. Um, you go over, especially over the the guys working on this in Berlin and Spain like to use the tractability index for some reason. The differentiation index uh, for me is, uh, as I said, nice and straightforward and it's just really the number of times that you need to apply a differentiation, usually to the algebraic constraints, but that you can convert the system to its underlying ordinary differential equation. In chemical engineering, this is quite interesting because a lot of our separation systems, uh, reactive flashes and reactive distillations, are indeed uh, index two systems. So uh, I gave a simple form here uh, that, in fact, are the examples I'm going to show here full in, can be written in this form. And it has a number of properties, not all of which we'll get into, some of which are exploited. Um, for index reduction, but by exploiting these properties, you actually run into some issues. So just an example of the differentiations that you would do here. Uh, if you differentiate that algebraic constraint once, you you get this uh, first equation written there. And I, I suppose the thing that should be pointed out is, and this has been exploited by um, Doughtedes, among others, up at uh, Minnesota, that if you look at the this first equation, that can be solved for the y vector. And despite the fact that, that, that it's an index two system, you can, you can actually get an explicit uh, expression for y after one uh, differentiation. But if you went ahead and actually converted to its ODE, you would need the second differentiation. And as you can see, after two differentiations, you have this expression for the time derivative of your y variable too. So just uh, to get out of the abstract and look in more uh, familiar examples, the first one we'll look at is reactive flash. Uh, I'm going to show the data that was presented originally by uh, Rodriguez and Malone for uh, an ethylene glycol reaction. And also there's a secondary reaction where ethylene oxide and ethylene glycol form a diethylene glycol. So, the underlying um, system, the dynamic representation of this system, if we fix the pressure and the heat input uh, of this reactive flash, here we have the differential equations. And then this final equation here, I, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is, the, you see the uh, vapor liquid equilibrium relationships just using simple k values for, uh, to have the ratio of y over x. And in fact, that last algebraic equation is just written to explain, in a way, how the equations were formed. It's really the first three equations there define the entire system. So in a way, you can see that this is an index two system, that because the variables here are your liquid mole fractions x, your vapor fraction uh, phi, and your temperature t. And if you look at that algebraic expression, your vapor fraction is missing from it. And the algebraic equation I'm talking about is that uh, vapor liquid equilibrium one. So in other words, how do you get this expression for vapor fraction? So if we, uh, then the data that was used to model this, as I said, we got your primary um, hydrogenation of your ethylene oxide and then your secondary reaction to form uh, diethylene glycol. Uh, these two rate expressions, hello, was there a question there? Oh yeah, just a quick question for you. Um, so what index is this system then, the reactive flash uh, column? Do you this know index that's two. What? Okay, index two. And uh, le let me go back to this equation here. And again, I'm probably confusing matters. Let me, I should probably just delete that. That was just for explanation. So this is the entire system here. And again, if you consider like X and Y, the X vector is your liquid mold fractions and temperature. Your Y vector is simply the vapor fraction phi. 
So this is index two, and it's actually in Hessenberg form also. Okay, so that is solvable by some of the uh, DAS pack or other packages. They can do the, the Hessenberg uh, form of index two. They can um, do that. Able to, what's that? No, sorry. Continue. Yeah, so I just wondered. You know, I I worked on a similar system to this, um, and we had to do quite a bit of rearrangement to get it into a form that could be solved by some of the MATLAB solvers. Um, did you have that same experience, or or were you able to um, to work with it because it's the Hessenberg form? Well, that it's a very interesting question. The the, the first I was tempted to use, um, and I've forgotten the name of the software, the one that Linda Petzold uh, wrote many years ago, mm. might be DASL, D-A-S-S-L. Right. And if you do, if you can, you can fool, that's really only for index one systems, but you can fool it into solving systems like this. Uh, mm. It was, it kind of gave me a headache, so I said, well, maybe there's easier ways of doing it. And actually, I have another PowerPoint here. Um, if, this is kind of a side. I wasn't actually going to introduce this, but if you look at the first differentiation, which is the first equation here, as I said, you can solve that for y. But if you apply that to our system, that means you can solve, get an explicit expression for the vapor fraction, v. Um, yep. So that's a way now you can get, and if you now plug that back into your differential equations, it's an ODE. It's an underlying ODE. Now, what's not mentioned, and in fact, uh, uh, I submitted a paper on this, is that when you do this, you always have at least one null eigenvector, or sorry, eigenvalue. That, and when you try and get MATLAB to solve this system, it gets very angry because it hits singularities near the steady state. Mm. That, that, so that, that null eigenvalue is only at steady state. So it, it goes fine until it comes close to steady state and then goes ballistic. So that's what actually uh, prompted me to look for alternatives, which is when I came across AP Monitor. Uh, okay, so this is the data. Then go back to here. Then the stability of steady states. Um, I was quite interested in this on the Lyapunov stability of these. And again, this is uh, kind of interesting because there's very little written in the chemical engineering literature on this uh, issue of stability when you have uh, higher index systems. Uh, Meyers, who's uh, based, I think she's retired now, is based in uh, Berlin, uh, has written a very good theorem, which is actually goes beyond Hessenberg form uh, systems. But for our intents and purposes, if it's in Hessenberg form, basically what it says is you can use the matrix pencil to define stability at the stationary points. So this is very similar to what you do with an ODE, is if you're um, eigenvalues are negative at the stationary point, you can say you have a stable solution. Otherwise, you have unstable. Now, instead of looking at the eigenvalues, you're looking at the generalized eigenvalues, which is formed, the B matrix is basically says which of your equations are uh, differential equations, which are algebraic constraints. And I just bring that up because then on that reactive uh, flash example that I showed, this does indeed have multiple solutions. So this is parameterized with respect to the residence uh, time on the x-axis. Uh, the first graph has vapor fraction, second graph has temperature. So you see this kind of a standard S-curve that's uh, you know, familiar to all undergraduates when they're studying uh, CSTRs. Uh, but this is a lot more common when you have your reactive flash, and we will continue on to the reactive distillation. But by applying this, so I, we kind of uh, follow the continuation path here, which I won't necessarily go into the details of how we did that. But at each point, I can immediately calculate whether it's stable or unstable by looking at these generalized eigenvalues. So. To how to monitor this then in AP, AP Monitor. Uh, and one of the things I was, let, let me go back here, one of the things I was interested in is showing uh, that the numerical behavior of these solutions did um, agree with what we were calling stable and unstable. Okay, let me get on to this slide here. 
Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to put this, uh, everyone that's used IP Monitor, these are just the, the standard uh, commands that have been set up. I, I did this via MATLAB. Uh, one of the tricks that John had showed me, uh, this was the time for this to come to steady state is very long. And when I was just sending kind of one data point at a time to the server up there in Utah and waiting for it to come back to Missouri, it was taking forever in a day. Uh, so John had shown me the trick where we could do this time shift. So by the first data, we'd use the, um, the read file. So we'd use the time horizon. And I would typically do like units about 400 in time and uh, send it back down. And this time shift is actually the number of data points. So it will then walk backwards 400 data points and redo it again. And this uh, was a huge time saver for me. So uh, for people that haven't used it, I would keep that little uh, trick in mind. Well then, so then the first example here we have of AP Monitor is just uh, showing the behavior at three of the steady states where you had uh, stable above and below uh, when you consider vapor fraction or temperature and the intermediate uh, solution we were characterizing as unstable based on its generalized eigenvalue. And all three of these, if we look at the top graph, all three of these are perturbations of the uh, residence time where you're at a steady state and you perturb it um, slightly, I mean not by a trivial amount, from 500 to 480. And you can see the top one and the bottom one um, just go straight to their nearby steady state whereas the intermediate one uh, after that perturbation drops to the lower steady state, which is, of course, what we'd expect. Now, the next graph I have, I was um, kind of arguing with myself whether or not to put it in. I don't know if people can see the, the blue line here. Uh, can you see that, John? Yes, I can see that. Oh, okay. Now, um, I was wondering whether or not this was um, a calculation anomaly. This was, I perturbed the residence time by the other direction, and in this case by a small amount. Oh, what just happened there? Oh, and did a little jump, it's back. Um, so again, the upper and lower steady states, um, you know, remain unchanged. They just move to their uh, neighboring steady state. The vapor fraction, uh, hovers along slightly changing, then drops down to negative values, which of course uh, is not possible in reality, but what it means is that it's gone into the subcooled phase uh, mathematically, so there is no vapor in there, and then starts um, correcting itself and quite rapidly goes up to the upper steady state, which is where we expected to go in the first place. Now, I did a few things where I tried to tighten and tighten the time horizon to uh, reduce any errors, but this is kind of what it converged to. Um, you know, all of the graphs, you look at the temperature down below, it behaves as, as you'd expect, the liquid and vapor fractions behave as you'd expect. I don't have an entirely satisfactory explanation for this. I intuitively, I feel that it's probably correct that it does it actually did go into the subcooled region, but uh, it's not quite uh, ready for a full explanation yet. And I don't know if you've seen behavior like this before, John, or anyone else. You know, um, that makes sense that it's gone, you know, if it goes into the subcooled, uh, say, you know, just liquid only, um, particularly if the vapor fractions, if you, if you have a, um, for example, a molar flow rate or a molar, molar holdup of vapor that, that goes to zero, then you have often bilinear terms where you have the holdup times a mole fraction on some of your species balances. And so mm -hmm. because the holdup has gone to zero, um, the optimizer says, well, that, that I'm multiplying by zero, so my other thing can really go wherever it wants. And so a lot of times you lose the physical realism of that state. Um, there's been some work, uh, I think Beagler did some work um, on uh, MPEX. Uh, so he, he showed a, a distillation column that uh, where some of the trays dried up and then came back again. And you've got a 
compose it in a little different way in order to uh, in order to have when you, when you do have uh, changes in the number of phases in some of these distillation columns um, in order to be able to model that appropriately because your your equations are actually changing right and uh, if you look at the in this case there was no uh, vapor holdup that that was assumed to be zero. Uh, you just have a vapor flow and you have a liquid hold up. But if you look at the temperature, as the temperature starts rising, what it does is a large difference in the vapor pressures between the ethylene oxide and ethylene glycol. As the temperature starts rising, it starts consuming the ethylene oxide, which then significantly reduces the vapor pressure of the system. So as you form that ethylene glycol, you actually go from a two phase into a single phase system, which is so mathematically, to me, it made sense. Uh, I, I'm just um, pointing out that I'm kind of grappling with uh, okay. the, the, the full kind of explanation of it. Okay, but I, I just wanted to put it up there anyway because it, it has its own interest. So if we go to um, a more interesting example, uh, I wanted to talk about reactive distillation, and this is just a uh, something I stole off the internet, which. Uh, my kids have shown me how to do quite easily. So, um, the reactive distillation example I wanted to talk about was uh, Leuven and you have written kind of a, a, a good textbook on this, which has some uh, idealized examples and then some uh, more realistic ones where they talk about control, etc. I wanted to talk about the idealized examples for a number of reasons. Um, the first one is just. Uh, a plus B goes to C, so it's a ternary system. Uh, your C was the heavy component, so that the top of your column was under infinite reflux, or in other words, there was no uh, product taken out the top. The goal uh, under this example that uh, they presented was to get 98% mole fraction of product C out the bottom. Um, so, they neglected the liquid sensible heat effects, uh, which I prefer not to do because then it gets rid of all your enthalpy equations. But uh, this, um, what I found in all the examples Leuven and you presented, which is quite interesting, even when I use their exact data, I would find at least two and normally three solutions where they had only presented one. Um, kind of underlining the fact that multiplicity is uh, very common in these. Of course, your uh, algebraic equation solver needs to be reasonably good to be uh, finding them. But so again, the, again talking about the layout, um, it was constant liquid holdup assumed on each stage, a thousand moles, sixteen stages, with the reaction confined to occur from stages two to ten. So down below us, you just had additional stripping of your product. So if I look at the solutions here. As I said, I was finding multiple solutions. This is the family of steady states, where at the conditions, the top graph is at the conditions Leuven and you presented, um, where a boil up, Vn is the uh, molar boil up at the bottom or from the reboiler of 62.47 moles per second. So if we allow the hold up to uh, change, we can see at the 1,000 mole hold up, that uh, they presented, we actually had three solutions. Now, what's more interesting, if we look at the bottom graph, if we fix the hold up, but uh, instead allow the boil up to change, the system or the family of steady states now uh, becomes separated. It's not a connected path. So I was wondering, and obviously the the interpretation of what would happen there is that in a real life uh, column, and I realize there's some uh, idealized assumptions here, but that you could fall from the upper steady state. Did you have a question, Mark? Uh, no, I didn't, sorry. Okay, I, you know, your name showed up in the corner of my uh, <laughs> computer here. Um, okay, so you could uh, be operating at the desired upper uh, steady state, of slightly greater than 0.98 uh, mole fraction of your desired product at the bottom, and then uh, start slowly reducing your boil up, seeing no effect. So the young engineer thinks he's saving money by reducing steam. 
and all, all of a sudden you fall down to the low purity. So I'll get into the model in a second, but the bottom graph here is uh, the output from AP Monitor, where the red dotted line is the boil-up rate, uh, where I reduce it from 70 moles per second down to 52. And at the same time, you can see the mole fraction of your product slowly falling from greater than 0.98 down to 0.88. And you can see if you look at, um, this is at 800 moles, so if you look at the top right-hand graph at 52.88 is where that steady state is. So again, the AP monitor accurately models what would happen when you do that reduction in boil-up. So the question is, and the more interesting one, if you made that mistake, how do you get back to the upper steady state? So these graphs would indicate that just re-increasing your boil-up is not going to be do you any good, particularly because the middle uh, set of steady states are unstable. So our original thought was, well, we could just introduce um, pure product C into the bottom of the column. But if I look here, this is uh, not a dynamic simulation, but just, uh, again, the steady state uh, as I introduce pure C into the bottom. So if you look at the top graph, we do indeed achieve what we think we need as we introduce C. We increase the mole fraction of C in that bottom stream. But the more interesting graph is the bottom right here, where we, if we instead track the moles of unreacted A, as we introduce C, this actually reaches a minimum and starts increasing again. So that the, we are forcing the reaction, this is an equilibri equilibrium reaction here, it's forcing us to the, back to the left. So uh, in other words, this is not going to ever work for us because this moles of unreacted A to get where we need to be needed to be less than, I think, 0.05 or 0.08 was the number. So if instead we look again at the bifurcation paths, if we look at uh, again, the top graph is at uh, modifying the boil up uh, with a fixed hold up of 800. Uh, if the reason I draw the two graphs on the bottom here is that there's an advantage to increasing the boil up to 70 moles per second in that the S curve becomes contracted so that where that blue arrow is, we can potentially move to the desired high purity steady state at a uh, hold up of what looks like about 16, 1700. Now, of course, we can't uh, change the hold up in a, a distillation column, but we can adjust the feed. We can get the equivalent, entirely equivalent uh, output by reducing the feed as increasing the hold up. So then the model I used for this reactive distillation for a fixed hold up here, these are the sets of equations. So we have component balance on each stage uh, and enthalpy balances on each stage, uh, which are our dynamic equations. The reaction is, uh, as we said, limited to occur just in stage 2 to 10, but you still have uh, the dynamic component mole balances. And then you have your algebraic constraints down below it, which are your vapor, vapor liquid equilibrium, your overall uh, mole balance. Uh, on the various stages. So when we do that, here was the first attempt to try and get to the upper steady state. So I reduced the feed, which is the red dotted line, uh, from 100% down to uh, 30%, held it there, and then brought it back to 100%. So if you look at the black line here, you can see that our mole fraction did what we wanted it to do, it actually got up to greater than 0.99 for a while. But unfortunately, when I increased the feed back up to its normal value, the mole fraction of C fell back to where it was. So in other words, this was a failure in an attempt to get back to the high purity steady state. And if you look at the second graph on this page, where you see this is monitoring the mole fraction of product C on stage 10, you can see that we were nowhere near to kind of uh, flattening out at our low feed rate, the mole fraction on this stage was still continuing to increase. So that uh, told us, well, why not increase the length of time that we were at this 
low feed rate. So if I go to the next one here, that's what we did. So we significantly increased the amount of time we're at this low feed rate. And in this case now we did come to a steady state, but as we made the transition we needed to, we're now at the upper steady state. And again on the bottom graph here, what we model is the mole fraction of C in stage 10. And you can see while it did not fully reach steady state, at the low feed rate, it was beginning to flatten out, which is what kind of helped us achieve uh, our desired goal here. And then kind of on a more negative one, just as kind of underlining what we said, if we tried to do the same thing instead by adjusting the boil up rate instead of the feed rate, um, this uh, AP monitor predicts exactly what we thought it would, which is that you end up right back where you, you started at your low purity steady state. And that's if we go back and look at these graphs here, the top one, we were moving along this uh, uh, bottom little mountain. And because these were all stable solutions, we just moved along that path. So then the other example, if you look at the literature, uh, most authors will use hold up as a dynamic variable. But this is still an index two system, unless you have a relationship between the vapor flow and the pressure. So if you assume that it's, um, you don't know anything about the pressure drop, you just assume isobaric throughout the column, it's still an index two system. So your equations become modified somewhat in, in that your hold up is uh, kind of contained within the derivative of your component balances. And then you have a dynamic uh, expression for the rate of change of hold up itself. Now, in this case, you don't have the separated curves in terms of the boil up. Your boil up is now an S curve that you would normally see. And it becomes uh, pretty straightforward to model the steady state transition. And again, you do this by reducing the feed rate if you're at the uh, lower, tra uh, lower point. OK, so I know I've kind of um, battered through this, but um, the conclusions I'm taking out of this is that, well, I don't know if this is a conclusion, it's a, a point more than anything, that in a lot of the configurations of the reactive flash and reactive distillation systems we're modeling, they are Hessenberg form of size two. Uh, for us, it's important to point that as we're tracking the family of steady states, that the stability of each of these steady states can be immediately calculated, that uh, multiple examples have shown us that AP Monitor can reliably traverse these orbits and no index reductions are required and that you know as recently as 2009 it's a it is a very good paper I'm not knocking it but um, Kumar and co uh, colleagues had a system where they modeled a reactive distillation similar to the uh, model we showed here but they did a they didn't refer to it as an index reduction but essentially it was by they got an expression for the vapor fraction by applying some derivatives. And to, as I mentioned earlier, that is going to in introduce null eigenvalues to the steady state, so it, which is an intrinsic weakness of the system. And then as a practicing engineer, you know what's most interesting to me is that these dynamic simulations are very useful for modeling uh, how you get from one steady state to the other, if you, indeed you did fall to a low purity uh, steady state. So um, that is that.